uh, I'm so happy to be here today uh, talking to you about how to run big rewrite projects. So this talk is drawn from my experience, as Mary said, working at Songkick. Songkick is a live music platform notifying you when your favorite artists come to town uh, and then helping you buy concert tickets. So I worked there for over eight years. Uh, and in that time, I had the chance to run three major rewrite projects for three very different products. The first one was songcake.com, uh, way back in 2011. Uh, we, were, we had a monolithic application, and we were rewriting them into uh, so, uh, front-ends and services. Uh, and the other two happened uh, after we merged with another company, and we inherited lots of great things, but also a rewrite project that was already ongoing for a ticket store, uh, and an internal tools product that needed some help. So, uh, I needed to come up with a name for this talk, and I had already done a similar talk about the first rewrite project that Songkick had, uh, so it was a continuation on the theme. So I picked uh, Big Rewrite Strikes again, so who knows who these charming men are? Yes, okay, great. Uh, so they're the Smiths. Um, so um, apparently their song titles are really perfect for this talk. Uh, and it's about Songkick, so it's music theme, so I thought it'd be nice. So I'll use their song titles throughout the talk, and if you know them and you spot them, you'll get a really nice playlist at the end. <laughs> cool. So I'll talk you through the journey of a rewrite project. So from identifying the problem uh, to beginning it and, and kind of selling it to, uh, to start it, run it, uh, finish it, uh, but most importantly, at the end, I'll tell you what, to do, what you need to not need this kind of project again. Cool. So the problem. Let's start. Um, everyone here is really great at their jobs. Uh, they're building great products and ri writing really good code. But somehow our code seems to fall into this inevitable path of disorder and chaos and growing way too much. Uh, why is that? So you might consider shipping a project to production as done, right? So the project might be finished, but the code is only really done once it's not running in production anymore. Like in the meantime, uh, it will be forever changing. So changing requirements, uh, you're fixing bugs, and even if you don't touch the code and you don't change anything, the infrastructure and the services around your code will change. So you require, it will require you to change your code. Uh, so that software disorder, and that's your code after a while, uh, so that software disorder or software entropy um, is always growing in your code. If you disregard that entropy, uh, you accumulate features and dependencies until it's too hard to make any changes to your code base. So songcake.com, on that rewrite in 2011, it was really hard to change because it was over-engineered. Uh, it had lots of slow tests, so that all made it hard to change. For the store and internal tools project, it was the opposite spect of the spectrum, so it was, there, were not, there was not enough structure uh, and there were not enough tests, so that also made it really hard to change. So Sarah May, another shout out for her, uh, used this metaphor to explain code like this, like a hoarder's house. Uh, there are really great and useful things in there, but they are hidden by all the mess and the unused stuff that you accumulated throughout the years. So it's really hard and risky to change anything. And you, even walking around this, this house, you might you know, have a pile of books falling on your heads. So you know something needs to be done, like this sort of house is way too dangerous. Uh, so if only you could throw it all away, uh, clean it all, uh, then everything will be better, right? You know it's a big project, it will take time, uh, and it will impact delivery of other features, but you know it's needed. So congratulations, we're about to embark on a big rewrite project. But before you start, I think you should ask yourself these two questions. So is it the right time, and is it the right reason? There is a point in time where it pays off to invest in maintainability, but maybe before that it might be better to uh, ship your changes to market as quickly as you can. Uh, and it's not always clear what that point is, but at Songcake we had two product development phases that helped define that point. So they're called product discovery and product delivery. So during discovery, the main goal is to learn as quickly as possible. And you know, as Kevin sa said before, like learn as fastly as you can. Uh, validate your hypothesis and discover the product market fit. Once that's validated, product delivery starts. And then during this phase, you're focusing on sta stabilizing and making sure the product or the feature is really uh, easy to change and extend uh, confidently. During product delivery is when investing in tech and a well-planned rewrite could be useful. 
It only makes sense to invest in a big technical project if the product you have has a proven value to the business today. So you're meeting with the product owner, and you're going to ask them, you know, you know that product that brings, brings in all the money, uh, and you want to add all those features to it? Well, actually, it's impossible to work with. Um, we need to throw it all away, completely rewrite it from scratch. And in the meantime, you can't add any new features to it. Is that OK? <laughs> um, I mean, their answer will probably be no. Uh, but hopefully, they'll also ask, why do you want to do that? Uh, and this is where having a really good uh, answer is important. So first, you need to find a business case for your project. If you're not sure what it is, it could be because maybe there isn't one, and the reason why you're doing this rewrite is an excuse to try out some new technology uh, or prototype something new. Uh, if that's the case, then stop right there. Uh, there should be a way for you to experiment and try out new things and learn new things without touching production systems. So, uh, but that's a topic for a completely different uh, talk. Um, so let's assume you know this isn't just an exercise in technology, uh, but you can't find the business case. Well. The answer to that is really easy. You just spend time with the business stakeholders and, and get to know the industry so you can understand what value technology is bringing to it. So then you can articulate how the current systems you have uh, are preventing you from that from happening. So if you can't explain this reason to someone outside of your technology team, uh, you don't have a good enough reason yet. And the business case will also depend on the context of where you work. So rewriting a project to make it easier to onboard people might be a good reason if you're hiring lots of people, but if you're not, Maybe you should dig a bit deeper. So is it the right reason? Yes, if there is a clear business case. Like We're not hired to deliver lines of code. We're hired to deliver a value in whatever form it takes uh, at the organization you work for. So find out where that comes from. Cool. <laughs> uh, it's my favorite slide. Uh, now you know what value this project will bring. So how can you get you know, the business on board? How can you sell this to whoever in your company decides how you're spending your time and your money? First, have one clear business case. So luckily, you already did your homework, so you have that. Uh, and it makes sense outside of the technology team, so good job. Uh, but it's important that's just one clear business case. Uh, you'll have lots of hard decisions to, do, uh, to make during this project. So having one clear goal will help you prioritize uh, and decide what, what to work on first. Create excitement on what the new world will look like. So this is not just about writing uh, the code, uh, making the code better or making the, fast, uh, the tests faster. This is about what you'll be able to do once this work is done. So make it about the transformation that will happen to your organization once this is finished. Paint this picture of a better future for everyone. Find people on other departments that are frustrated as you. They'll help you advocate for this project once they see how the, the value that this project will bring to, to them as well and make their jobs better. Uh, there is an expectation mismatch between how easy it should be to change this code and how easy it actually is. Uh, so help the people that are actually doing the changes every day in the code understand why uh, that is. So find creative ways of communicating this into, um, to other people without going into technical details. So this terrible diagram that I did here uh, with lots of red boxes indicating danger and lots of squiggly lines uh, and green boxes indicating uh, the maintainable code. Um, the one that I did for the Sonkey project was just slightly more detailed than this. Uh, but it was uh, good enough to have a good sense of what was hard to maintain and, and why. Another good way of making the paint visible is using lots of metaphors. So the hoarder's house, I've used urban planning, gardening, personal hygiene, I don't know. Pick, pick the one that will resonate with the people that you work with. So it's not going to be one magical half-hour presentation that you're going to have all the buy-in you need uh, to do this project. It will take time, and it will take persistence. Uh, you'll require to, you, you to repeat your message multiple times to, to different people. So have a clear message when communicating. Uh, use those diagrams. Use those metaphors, if possible, in all communications that you have. This is going to be really useful, because there's a lot of power in getting everyone speaking the same language and understanding this project. So have I mentioned that you have to repeat yourself? Um, yes, I can't remember how many times I did presentations uh, on, and variations on the presentation of that store and internal Sioux project and why we needed to do it. But it was really necessary to get everyone on board. Cool. So the whole company is on your side. You're ready to start. Uh, but do you know where you're going? Uh, so have it 
clear technical vision for the future. So this is for your, your team, your uh, engineering team. Have a clear technical vision for the future. Again, it doesn't need to be detailed. See my, my diagram again? Um, its purpose really is to show an overview of the current state and what the future will look like and what are the guiding principles that you're going to use to get there. You're not, got, you're not going to get everything right. Like This is not about upfront specification. Decide what's right for, for now, and then review those decisions as you learn more. Technical architecture is not set in stone. It's a process. The actual path to this vision will dis be discovered by you and by your team uh, as you take the first steps. If you're not sure what the first step is, you can experiment on prototypes that can prove uh, different approaches that you might think you can do. So, uh, for the songkick.com rewrite, um, we had a technical vision of moving towards decoupled front ends and services, but we had different ideas about how to get there. So we time box two weeks to prototype different technical approaches. This time was really useful to understand the pros and cons of each approach, uh, and then agree, most importantly, on what we believe will get us to where we want it faster. So the point here is that the tech team should be excited about this vision, and they should understand why you're getting there. Cool, so how do you get from that current state to that tech vision? So your, your first approach might be, you know, throw it all away, start over, rewrite from scratch, you know, what a dream. So what does it look like when you're rewriting an application from scratch? I'm gonna get some water. So there are usually two teams. Uh, one of them is maintaining the legacy application because you, you know, people are using it, uh, and the other one is building the new one. Um, until eventually, it's done, so you deprecate the legacy application. So a greenfield project like this is really easier to reason about. It's all shiny and new. There is no baggage holding you back. But there are many issues with this approach. And I think the biggest one is that value is only delivered at the very end. You don't know if what you're building is the right thing. You don't know if it's maintainable. Uh, you don't know even if this is the product that you and your customers still want. You only discover these answers at the end. So Martin Fowler coined uh, this rewrite approach as a strangler ap application. So another metaphor that comes from strangler vines. The strangler vine uh, starts growing from the upper branches of a tree, kind of gradually working their way down to the soil. So the strangler vine is your new application, gradually replacing the legacy one. So this is what it looks like. You usually have one team, both maintaining and rewriting the functionality into a new system. So this is the new new system, kind of, and eventually, again, replacing the legacy application. Uh, you don't have to necessarily use the same technology, so you can start a completely new project uh, or use a new language or whatever you want. It, this is especially easier for web applications, so you replace a, a workflow or a web page at a time and then link between those two applications. Because of that, you can see that it's more complicated to understand it because it means while the rewrite is in progress, because it means you're untangling the legacy system and you, you need to understand how to connect the two applications. But the big positive is that it delivers value continuously and early. So you're completely replacing the legacy application feature by feature until it disappears. So testing the complete end-to-end -end delivery of this new product. This means also communicating with all areas of your company to get the project delivery. So migrate users uh, and do actually deliver it to production and monitor it there. Because of this, there is also an incentive to pick features by priority order. Uh, so then when a new feature comes in, you can add it to the application at any point of this, uh, of this uh, process. So we use this uh, approach many times at Songcake, and I highly recommend it. Like, it allows you to adapt uh, and change direction as you need. It has better cost management, and you can even pause this work at any time here, and you have something better than you had before. But ideally, you know, what you want is to finish this faster and the fastest way possible, right? So a great way to finish faster is reducing the scope and only focusing on rewriting what's really needed. You should use this opportunity as a reset. So again, going back to that songcake.com we write in 2011, like Songcake was a, a, a very bloated application. While we were trying to find a product market fit, we piled on lots and lots of features to see what users wanted. So releasing changes got harder and harder. Uh, it was really hard to tell what was valuable from what wasn't, so we're just maintaining all of that. 
So what we did was, uh, with the product owner and the design team, we went through a process of identifying Songkick's main proposition. So the, the reason why users kept coming back to Songkick. The features that power that proposition, we identified or classified as bones. Uh, features that were improvements on that, we classified as muscle. And then features that we have built, but since learned that they aren't as valuable as we thought they were, we classified as fat. So another metaphor, <laughs> bones, muscle, fat, is a framework for us to identify the value of features in products. And it was really hard, um, especially because at the time I was a user of some of those fat features. Um, but going through this, uh, it was really important for us to understand and agree on what was valuable and, and what was important and what wasn't. Uh, so this is, I think, one of the main reasons why that songcake.com rewrite was really successful, was because we weren't trying to rebuild everything. So ask yourself this question. You know, if you're starting over, what would you build today, knowing what you know now? Use that framework to identify the values of features that you have. Cool. So once you decide on the technical approach, you have a clear uh, path to this, to this future that you have, it's time to take big risks for big gains. Uh, you have one clear uh, main business goal, so use that to find your biggest blocker, create a realistic plan to remove it, and then do it. Uh, so this is how you avoid having, to, uh, having too many half-finished attempts uh, at rewriting or migrating tech. There will be lots of different things you know you should do, but focus on completely doing just one at a time. So for Songkick last year, it was decommissioning the ticket store application. Uh, it was only 80% done, but the 20% had no clear end in sight. Um, so what we did was a plan to finish any features that were ongoing, cut all the features that weren't bones, and then together with the sales team, we created a migration plan for all the clients still using the legacy application. It wasn't glamorous work, uh, but after that, we could unblock ourselves to improve lots of other parts of the system that we had. Cool. During the project, you'll be making lots of behind-the-scenes technical changes. But don't forget that this is a company-wide project, and it's impacting everyone. So if you can, like, show inter progress internally. So prioritize delivering business wins as you go. Like, make sure the rest of the organization feels supported and that you're on their side. Like, this is not just an exercise in technology. So for example, when, you rewrite, when we were rewriting the internal tools project, we focused on the main business tasks first, the ones that were the most painful to, to other departments. And then we added like, quick user experience wins along the way when we could. Celebrate. Um, so find ways to celebrate technical changes that are too esoteric or maybe too boring for non-technical people to understand or care, uh, like code simplification and deletion. So it's really hard to get people excited about, about, about a burned down chart. Um, <laughs> find other kind of creative ways to celebrate what you've achieved. So here are a couple of examples from Songkick. When that legacy ticket store was finally decommissioned a year ago today, so congratulations to the Songkick team who's here and, and everyone out there. Um, we celebrated uh, by having the, the original developer and the product manager, they decided to write an obituary for, for the project, like as if it was a person. So this, this is the, the application near the Songkick office in New York. Uh, it was a celebration of a new beginning, but it was also an acknowledgement of all the great value and all the great things that the company, uh, that the project had brought to the company. It was really, really sweet. So Songkick's incredible product designer, Karim, uh, created a game around the strangler of the internal tools application. So he mapped the team's goals and metrics to badges and achievements. So here are some of my favorites. Uh, the table smasher for a number of removed deprecated tables. Uh, <laughs> And the uh, force shift one, this is my favorite. So this is the percentage of usage of the new application versus the legacy one. So you'd expect the force to shift, the balance to shift towards the new one with time. And of course, there was a, a games hero. Uh, so they printed all those badges on the wall near where, where the team sat. Uh, and each ach achievement had a party popper for extra excitement. So everyone in the office knew when a new achievement was unlocked. <laughs> um, Yes, <laughs> repeat yourself. It's a long project, so keep going back to that tech vision and the business goal and updating the team uh, with its, the progress and reminding everyone why you're doing this work. Okay, so how to finish it? Um, 
You won't, <laughs> at least not completely, uh, and it's okay. Uh, priorities will change. You won't have enough time to do everything that you want to do. That's why you pick an iterative approach like the Strangler application. That's why you break down your project as much as you can and try to pick the changes with the highest impact first. So within three months of starting the rewrite of songkick.com, you know, five years ago, we were able to decouple front ends uh, and unlock what we needed to innovate and bu build new products. So after that, we split the teams focusing on new products and then had a smaller team working on finishing the migration. So we got to a good place quickly, even though we hadn't completely finished the migration then. This rewrite should be viewed as a one-time opportunity. It's focus time that you can put all your effort into unblocking as quickly as you can. But you need to find ways to keep this work going under normal conditions as well. So you should use this opportunity to rewrite, oh, sorry, you should use this rewrite as an opportunity to adopt good habits. So I'm happy to say we haven't had to rewrite songcake.com since that rewrite five years ago. Uh, and the store in internal tool products, uh, the improvements are still uh, in progress, uh, but these products are being used uh, and new features are being added to both. Software entropy is a reality. Like if you're supporting software that's being used, you need to maintain it and change it. So the important thing is to keep ahead of that entropy and keep it at a manageable level, and when possible, reduce the scope uh, or the amount of code that you need to maintain. So we, as I said before, like we know maintaining software has a cost, but the people not writing your code every day, it's really hard for them to grasp what that means. So find ways of making that cost visible. So I mentioned the diagrams and the metaphors. And another way that we did it at Songkick was uh, by having a product inventory. So at Songkick, uh, every quarter we reevaluate the business goals uh, and how they're mapped to the cross-functional product teams. And at that time, I noticed that we had always more products and projects than we had teams. And it wasn't really clear what level of maintenance those other projects were expected to have. So I started a list of everything that we had uh, and defined their level of maintenance with the product managers. And then that became part of our process. So each quarter we would review and define the level of maintenance for each product and then which team would own it. Code is only finished when it's not running in production anymore, as I said. So make sure that the code that you have is bringing enough value to justify its maintenance. If not, delete. Uh, that code should be deleted, no questions asked. Uh, everyone's using a version control system here, I hope. So just delete code. There's no key reason to keep uh, code that's not uh, being used anymore. Um, yeah, and don't even mention like commented out code. Like that just makes me upset. So <laughs> delete that code. That's easy. But go a step further uh, and make reviewing whole features and whole products part of this process. So as part of that maintenance level conversation at Songkick, the answer sometimes was, you know, this should be deprecated. And that was okay. Like it's part of the life cycle of features and products and it doesn't imply anything about the, the code's quality. It means you've learned something and now you're reacting to it. So you as a tech lead should bring the cost of maintaining those products and the impact it has on software development. And then product and business should bring information about the usage and the value of those products. And then together, you can decide whether it's worth keeping it running and paying that cost or whether it should be deprecated. When you make those decisions together, it reduces surprises and it increases your support when you might need uh, time to invest in maintainability. So you should constantly be doing this reevaluation and asking this question. Um, and then delete what's not that. So to keep software entropy under control, you need to be thinking about how to support and encourage day-to-day -day cleanups. So it wasn't like one big decision that brought this project to this place. It was all the small decisions one day at a time that we didn't kind of clean up as, as we went and we ended up with that hoarder's house. So to avoid that, you need to do housekeeping. Uh, in case you're wondering, this is not a Smith song title, unfortunately. Um, okay, uh, so create the discipline of making those small uh, decisions to make things a bit better every day. So refactor, so improve the design of your code without changing its behavior. Do that refactoring a little bit and often, and don't ask for permission to do it. So refactor the story or the work or the feature that you're doing today. Like if you're changing that code today, it means it's already prioritized, so it's, it's valuable to the business. So before you do that change, refactor the code to make it a bit better. 
So some, we also try to find multiple ways of making sure this is part of our, uh, their daily habit. The first one, I think the most important one really, is by communicating and educating product managers and designers and coaching developers so that they know that this work is expected to be done during feature work. We also used our firefighting rota as an opportunity to improve our systems. Uh, focus, like it was a more focused and structured time to get this kind of work done. But the most important thing is to get everyone on the same page that this is part of your day-to-day -day work, really. Also, get used to inconsistencies in your code. So your code is never going to be perfect. It's not the goal anyway. You know, the goal is to deliver business impact, and a project that's doing that is by definition changing and evolving. So we will have inconsistencies. Get used to it. Uh, and I also talked a lot about communication and collaboration and talking to people and all of that. So this is really important. So learn about what matters to your clients uh, and your users. Understand how other departments in your company work and what they care about. And then help them understand what's important to you as a tech leader. That knowledge will give your team autonomy to make your own decisions with uh, their business, con like the business context in mind. Cool. So I started this talk in the same, talking about big rewrite projects, but really it's a talk about how to build maintainable and sustainable technology. And, when, and to know when to invest in big technical projects with the business context in mind. So do it at the right time and with a clear business goal. Iterate on delivering it and reduce the scope as much as you can. And when you're done, keep making your code better as part of your day-to-day -day work. Make software maintenance uh, cost visible and part of the business conversation. We're not really hired to deliver lines of code. You're hired to deliver business impact and positive business impact. So understand where that comes from so you can make decisions with open eyes, knowing when to cut corners and when to invest in maintainability. Thank you. Here are the songs in case you missed them. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>